Okay, let's uh, begin with the last session, the, the last talk of this session, sorry. Our speaker is Peter Ludlow from the uh, University of Campinas. Uh, his talk is titled Concepts as Lexical Items, Amelioration as Motivation. Peter. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to everyone who came to make this uh, fun little conference. And uh, it's been a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to tomorrow as well. So, uh, there are basically two big ideas I want to get across today. First is that concepts are lexical items, and uh, the second is that amelioration is modulation. And don't worry, I'm going to explain what that is. But uh, I want to qualify this a little bit. When I say that concepts are lexical items, I, I, I want to qualify it so that we understand this, that lexical items are the go-to medium as vehicles of concepts and thoughts. That is to say, I'm not gonna be arguing that uh, they're the only medium for concepts and thoughts, but it is because of the rich recursive structure of natural language that we have the robust conceptual system that we do. Okay. Uh, also, when I say that they are lexical, when I talk about concepts and I talk about lexical items, I intend that properly understood. And so when I'm talking about concepts as psychological objects, uh, I, I'm talking about them as um, psychological objects in a very general sense. That is, I'm going to be ecumenical about what kinds of psychological objects they are. So for example, uh, you might believe that concepts in psych cognitive psychology are e anchored externalistically as Tyler Burge has argued, I mean, that's fine. If you're an internalist about the nature of concepts or if you're an in, in, in externalist about the nature of concepts in your cognitive psychology, all of that's fine. Uh, so I wanna be very ecumenical here. And hopefully what I have to say here is going to apply to any version of the theory of concepts you might prefer uh, as long as it's you know a theory of concepts within the province of cognitive psychology. So the big background idea here is that natural language is the vehicle for complex representational human thought. Um, this is very much in line with a position put forward by uh, Peter Carruthers in his 1996 book. Uh, I like the way that he puts it, which is that language is constitutive of human thought. Um, that is to say, it's um, not necessarily constitutive of all thought. So there are people like Davidson, perhaps Wittgenstein, McDowell and others, lots of philosophers who thought, well, you know, babies and animals, they can't really have thoughts. I mean, none of that is going on in here. Uh, we're being flexible and we're saying that um, the kind of, as it were, the vehicle of thought are these concepts. Other animals might have other kinds of systems. The background is going to be just vanilla generative linguistics. Uh, we could use the minimalist model as an example where you have the lexicon feeds into, an, uh, into enumeration. And the key thing is that uh, there is a, uh, the level of representation LF, which is your interface with the conceptual intentional system. And my view is basically that once you get to LF, um, basically all of the representational work is done. In saying this, I can sharpen up what I just said uh, by making my target clear. And Ray Jackendoff in his 2002 book gives a very clear example of the position I'm arguing against. Um, what we have here are two representations for the sentence, the little star is beside the big star. The representation on the left is syntactic structure, sort of a 1980s vanilla syntactic structure. The one on the right is oh, Jackendoff's version of conceptual structure. And uh, crucially, Jackendoff thinks that you need both things. I wanna say from the outset, there's something a little bit unfair about the syntactic structure given on the left in that he has pruned the, all the lexical material from this syntactic tree. And as far as I'm concerned, 
concerned that syntactic structure should include the lexical information. Indeed, there are versions of the lexicon in which they're simply, it is simply continuous of, of standard vanilla syntax. And my, my position here is going to be that we don't need that conceptual structure on the right-hand side. In particular, all of the information that we have in the left-hand side representation is still there in that right-hand sided representation. Now, sure, a lot of information disappears in that right-hand representation. So for example, the syntactic categories are missing, but this is sort of irrelevant to the issue of how you represent meanings. So again, the thesis is going to be that in terms of representation of meaning in the human mind, the syntactic structure is enough. You don't need to posit an additional conceptual structure. In effect, I'm invoking William Ockham and his infamous razor in order to do this. Don't uh, reproduce entities beyond need. Another way of thinking about this is that uh, we could think of it in terms of data structures. And in the theory of computation, there are lots of different ways of organizing data or information into different kinds of structures. One of the key things you have to realize is that, you know, the fact that you package the information in a different structure, say a tree instead of a graph or instead of a list or something, does not mean you have more information. It's just a different way of packaging that information. And the question is, well, what is the optimal way of doing that? So let's say something about the lexicon. So we're on the same page here. Uh, the canonical view or a canonical view uh, we get from generative linguistics and work on the lexicon. I'm thinking of work by Jane Grimshaw and Ken Hale and Jay Kaiser, James Pustyovsky and others. Uh, an example of this kind of work in lexical semantics is, comes from uh, Hale and Kaiser. Um, and this is the Jim Higginbottom gloss on it for the verb cut, uh, which is that cut applies truly to situations E involving a patient Y and an agent X, who by means of some instrument Z affects in E a linear separation in the material integrity of Y. Here's another canonical view of the lexicon. This is from head-driven phrase structure grammar. Uh, basically, you're encoding, this is for the verb eat, uh, you're encoding all of that information or similar types of information as in the uh, Higginbottom gloss, but in this case, we're encoding a lot more syntactic information that's going to play a role in structure building. So in HPSG, uh, that lexical item is also going to be very key uh, or the driver in, in constructing a syntactic tree. I mentioned amelioration and modulation in the beginning, and you're probably wondering what it is that I was talking about. So amelioration applies to concepts and modulation is going to apply to lexical items. And uh, amelioration is the idea that we can change or engineer the range of a particular concept. Now I say range instead of extension. Uh, what I mean is that the concept ranges over certain things, right? So uh, the concept of dog ranges over certain things. I'm saying range instead of extension because uh, I want this to be open textured in a way. Similarly and analogously, when we talk about modulation, we're saying that we can change the range of a lexical item. So let me, let me give you an example. Uh, it was not so very long ago that it was considered conceptually incoherent by many people that there should be this, uh, such a thing as same-sex marriage. Uh, on my view, what we're fundamentally doing here when we talk about changing the concept of marriage, we are basically just changing the range of the lexical item marriage or the meaning, if you prefer, you could think of it like you're changing the meaning of the word. So what's really going on? Are we changing the concept or are we changing the meaning of the term? On my view, basically it, that comes to the same thing. So my plan then um, is to, first of all, say uh, a general uh, thesis or state a general thesis, which is an effect that natural language is the vehicle of thought. And in doing this, I want to respond to a number of arguments that have been given, um, in particular by Jackendoff and Pinker, 
And then some more subtle recent uh, arguments that have been given by Petrosky and Chomsky. And then time remaining, I'm gonna say a little bit about how conceptual engineering and lexical modulation works, mostly by way of just giving an illustration. I won't go into great detail about that. So let's get to the objections. Um, objection number one, and these, this first batch is from Jack and Doss Patterns in the Mind. Objection one, if natural language is the language of thought, then it would be a mystery why it is possible to translate from one language to another say from Japanese to English. Quoting Jackendoff, the basic reason for keeping language and meaning separate is that pretty much anything we can say in one language can be translated to any other, preserving the thought that the original language conveys. This means that thoughts can't be embalmed in the form of any single language. They must be neutral as to what language they are expressed in. Uh, as Jackendoff then says in the next page, thought must be distinct from the linguistic garb in which it is clothed. Now, my response to this is twofold. First of all, I wonder to what extent Japanese and English LFs are actually different. And I know that on a lot of versions of linguistic theory, they begin to converge at the level of LF. But secondly, and more importantly, you can syntactically express the same thought in many different ways. That is to say, syntactic forms and thoughts do not stand in a one-to-one -one relation. So for example, if you have uh, a propositional calculus, if P then Q or P implies Q, you can express that in any number of different ways, like not P or Q, not Q, Q therefore P, not P. And you can also express it in um, a number of different ways in Polish logic notation given on the right. Now, um, now, uh, there is a kind of error that takes place here, I think, which is that when, when we say something like, well, you can express the same thought in all these different syntactic ways, the error is in thinking that, well, there must be some representation, some mental representation that all of those different things share. And that's the thing that I disagree with. I agree that all of these representations have the same truth conditions, or if you prefer that they have the same model theoretic properties, or if you prefer that they have the same inferential relations. All of that's perfectly fine to say. What is a mistake I submit is, some, is proposing an extra layer of conceptual structure. Argument number two, which is thinking is not present to consciousness, but is intuitive. Now my response to this is why we would suppose that all linguistic cognition uh, must be or should be present to consciousness. I mean, certainly none of the rules are. Um, furthermore, there's a question of how broadly we're taking thinking here. So I'm talking about representational thoughts and surely without doubt, there is lots of cognition that takes place that has nothing to do with language, right? So all kinds of, I assume that all faction is intensely computational. I've been persuaded of this by certain people working in all faction. Uh, it's computational, but it obviously, it doesn't have anything to do with the language faculty. So I wanna be clear that I'm talking not about cognition in general, but just about specific representational thoughts. And as I said initially here, uh, I don't see any reason to suppose that uh, all of the linguistic structures that I construct are present to consciousness. So I've been talking for 10 to 15 minutes so far. And in that time, I have reflected consciously on the sentences I've been uttering approximately zero times, right? So lots of the linguistic activity that we engage in is not at, at least in that moment present to consciousness. I think that's a little bit of a red herring as to whether we want to think about linguistic structures as being uh, the vehicles of thought. Objection number three from Jackanoff, Jack and Doff, quoting, the syntactic structure of language is built out of things like nouns and verbs, prepositional phrases and tenses, but thought isn't built out of such units. Thought concerns things like objects, actions, properties, and times. That is, there's supposed to be some mismatch between language, even I language, and thought. Now, uh, 
I want to point out that there really isn't a mismatch here. Um, syntax and thought, as far as I can see, are isomorphic to each other. So it's true that tenses are not times, but tenses denote times. Nouns are not things, but they do refer to things. And we don't even, you know, I, I don't know if Jackendoff is being uh, externalist when he talks about times and when he talks about uh, referring to things, but it, you know, if you're an internalist, you just say, well, there are these objects in Chomsky's domain D or something like that, or intentions, intentional objects in George Ray's sense. Um, um, the idea is that there's this isomorphism here, and it's because of this isomorphism that we're able to talk about the world and states of affairs in the world. Again, you don't need an intermediary layer, sorry, intermediary layer of representation in order to accomplish this. Um, more to the point, there is nothing that conceptual syntax can do that straight syntax, this is Jack and Off's term, straight syntax cannot do. Syntax is syntax. That is to say, if there was some problem we had with natural language being a vehicle of thought, you don't miraculously solve this problem by taking syntactic structure and sticking it into another module and saying, well, now that we call it conceptual structure, all of these problems with syntax dissolve and disappear, right? Any problem you have with natural language syntax would be reconstructed in a conceptual syntax. Now, regarding the uh, previous argument, there's a possible rejoinder for Jack and Off here, which is that thought and syntax can't actually be isomorphic because elements of syntax are not consistent in their interpretation. So for example, a noun phrase like the mayor could be a denoting expression or it could be a predicate expression under certain circumstances as in John is, or Javi is the mayor. Um, the reply, however, is, is that the interpretation of the mayor is not in isolation, but in the context of an entire sentence or discourse fragment. And I would say that this applies to quantificational structure as well. I mean, this is a view that like Sasha Zivanovitz and I presented in our book, which is that the quantificational structure is a kind of global property. It doesn't come from the individual determiner phrases themselves. I want to turn now to Pinker. A number of these objections are from his book, The Language Instinct from 1994. Uh, the first batch of them kind of go together. Uh, first of all, that babies cannot think in words because they have not yet learned any. Secondly, that monkeys cannot think in words because they are incapable of learning them. And that many human adults claim to do their best thinking without words. Let's take the monkey, or sorry, let's take the baby case first. Um, babies cannot think in words because they have not yet learned any. Well, okay, so first of all, we need to ask the question whether babies have interesting representational thoughts or merely cognition. And secondly, to the extent that they have representational thoughts, I've said throughout this talk that rep other representational systems can be deployed for simple thoughts. So it might be even rudimentary linguistic representation or sort of like early version of the language faculty representations that will uh, become more robust through time. But the basic idea is that uh, you're not limited to one set or type of, of, of representational system. Secondly, the case of monkeys, the reply here is the same as in the baby case. Other animals can deploy other representational systems. Human thought is robust precisely because its vehicle is the re rich recursive structure of natural language. Thirdly, was there a arg is the argument that many human adults claim to do their best thinking without words. And Pinker gives the example of the guy who invented or discovered carbon rings, benzene rings. Uh, this is the story of the guy who, you know, he had a chain of six carbon atoms that he wondered why the valence of that molecule was so weird. And then he had a dream of a snake biting its tail. And then he realized, oh, the string of carbon atoms must form a ring. Uh, the problem is that these show that images can be the occasion of thoughts, but they are not yet representational thoughts. 
I mean, many people have seen and uh, imagined a snake biting its tail. There's nothing in that image which has the thought that carbon atoms form a benzene ring. You have to take that image and then layer an interpretation over that using language. Pinker number four, thoughts are ambiguous and linguistic forms supposedly are not. So consider a sentence like monster truck tires out where you might interpret this as saying either that the, the, a monster truck got tired or alternatively that monster truck tires are ruled out for some reason, like they're aesthetically unpleasing or something. But the answer here is simply that, you know, we're interested in where the noun phrase is here. Is it monster truck tires out or is it monster truck tires are out? And obviously we can represent this syntactically. I mean, this is syntax 101. In fact, it's basically the same point that is made in the, the, in the flying planes can be dangerous example, which in many cases, people not only learn in, in the first semester of, of li li linguistics, but in the first class, right? So are we talking about the act of flying planes can be dangerous or that flying can, planes can be dangerous because they might drop bombs on you? Pinker's objection number five is that natural language representations lack logical explicitness. Quote, English sentences do not embody the information that a processor needs to carry out common sense. This just turns out to be false. So uh, Sasha uh, Zivanovitz tomorrow is going to be giving our presentation, uh, which is uh, going to talk about a account of natural language that is proof theoretic. And what you can do is construct a proof theoretic semantics for natural language and carry out all of these explicit logical inferences. I mean, it might not be obvious that you can do that. So it's not what Pinker is saying is not obviously false, but it does turn out to be false. Objection number six, natural language is unable to account for co-reference. We might introduce a subject in our discourse as the tall blonde, tall blonde man with one black shoe, but subsequently refer to the individual as him. How do we know we're talking about the same individual? And of course, the answer is that syntax can obviously track this type of information by indexing. Now, you know, I'm aware that in the last few years, Chomsky and other people have become suspicious of indices, but, you know, if we're making a point about what is possible in the syntax of natural language, surely co-reference is easily represented there. But then this also raises a question that I've alluded to earlier. If linking up the individual is somehow you know, difficult or a problem in straight syntax, why would it not be a problem in language of thought syntax or in conceptual structure? As a general point, anything that is an issue or a problem for straight syntax, you're gonna have precisely the same problem when you start talking about conceptual syntax. Objection seven. Natural language is unable to handle conversation specific words like I, you, here, now, et cetera, since their meanings vary from context to context. But I don't see how this is a problem if it is a problem um, for natural language syntax, because there's no reason to see or think that natural language syntax can't track contextual information. Indeed, you could even encode that contextual information in syntactically, right, in terms of syntactic expressions. And again, how is this less of a problem if it is a problem for anyone for a language of thought syntax? Objection eight, natural language is unlike the language of thought fail to account for synonymy. Thus they allegedly cannot account for why John sprayed the wall with paint and John sprayed paint onto the wall, why they mean the same thing. Again, this is the same as the Japanese slash English objection from Jackendoff. And the answer remains that you can express the same thought in many different ways. So even if these turn out to be syntactically different, it doesn't mean they have to express the same content. Again, note that even in the language of thought, uh, there could be many ways of expressing the same content, right? Unless you 
have to stipulate that there's a one-to-one -one matching, uh, there's no reason that there couldn't be two different ways or n different ways of expressing the same content or the same thought in many different ways in, this, in the syntax of a conceptual syntax. All right, I wanna turn now to uh, a more nuanced view of the matter, uh, which is currently being advocated by Chomsky and Paul Petrosky. And the view is nuanced in the following way. What they're arguing is that, well, thought, sorry, natural language is important to having thoughts, but it's not identical to thoughts. Uh, they are the instructions, natural language structures or syntactic objects are instructions for constructing thoughts. So in this uh, bit that follows, I'm going to be following from uh, a correspondence between Chomsky and Chris Collins uh, that Chris published on his blog on uh, last November 21st. So it's just an email exchange organized as a kind of an interview. So here's Chomsky describing the view in question. One possibility is that I language generates instructions to other systems to form thoughts rather than as phonology provides instructions to our, our articulators to rather as phonology provides instructions to articulators to produce sounds. That's basically Petrosky's position adopting the general perspective that we share. All right, so in this correspondence, Chomsky offers, first of all, the polysemy objection, and, and Paul puts a lot of weight on this as well. Uh, quoting Chomsky, Petrosky pays a lot of attention to polysemy, as I have. Quote, the book is easier to burn than to understand. There's no entity in the world that has the properties attributed to book, so other mental organs have to go to work to construct actual thoughts. See what he's saying here? There's a kind of Easier to burn is a kind of concrete physical book and understand means the book is a kind of abstract object. My response would be why can't the grammar encode these kinds of shifts from concrete to abstract and you know, keep track of what's going on there. In fact, I don't know how you guys will feel about some of these pairwise comparisons of examples, but I do feel that syntax sees a difference between the concrete and the abstract in some of these cases. So I think that uh, what book did John Wright and Sam Byrne is a little bit better than what book did Sam Byrne and Sam, did John Byrne and Sam write? I think that uh, everyone who wrote a book burned it is a bit better than everyone who burned a book wrote it. I think that what book did John write and Fred steal from the library is a little bit better than what book did John steal from the library and Fred write. Um, and my understanding is that Richie Kane has also been um, pursuing a line, something like this. I, I haven't seen his work, that's just secondhand. And I what I think is that all of these examples feel like a kind of syntactic difference here as though the syntax actually is tracking this difference between the concrete case of the noun and the abstract case of the noun. What the theory looks like, I don't know, but the point I'm making is that it, it looks like a kind of syntactic problem. Secondly, and surprisingly for me, there is the anaph anaphora objection. So quoting Chomsky from this, uh, uh, correspondence again, just take a simple case like spelling out interpretation of a pronoun as either anaphoric or freely referring, same structure, different thoughts in a case like his mother thinks John is a genius. Now, I want to say I found this surprising because, um, I mean, this is the guy who wrote lectures on government and binding in, in which this is very explicitly represented in different ways, right? In one case, John is co-indexed with his, and the other case, it's not co-indexed with his. And in fact, there's disjoint reference. So uh, Chris Collins replies to Chomsky in this correspondence here. He says, well, okay, consider John thinks he's intelligent. You have one interpretation in which he and John are co-referential, 
the other interpretation in which they're not. Uh, as, as it turns out, this is all quoting Collins here, in the language UA, you distinguish these interpretations morphologically. For case A, UA uses the logophoric pronoun ye. For uh, the B interpretation, UA uses the non-logophoric pronoun a. All right. So not only, not only were the resources and syntax available to do this in, say, Chomsky 1981, but we find natural language encode this difference. So it looks a lot like something syntactic is going on here. The third objection that Chomsky gives in this correspondence is one that I'll call the inference objection. And again, quoting Chomsky, if I say that Tom, Dick, and Harry sang and danced all night, my actual thought might be that Tom sang and Dick and Harry danced. So what's up with that? So I have a kind of, there's a kind of mismatch between what I'm actually thinking and what I'm actually externalizing when I speak. Collins had an interesting idea here, which is that, first of all, you have Tom sang and Dick and Harry danced. He says, well, look, there's an inference from that to be Tom, Dick and Harry sang and danced all night. And so what you say is B, right? So in, now this is now quoting uh, Collins. So it is not the case that B externalizes A directly, rather B is an inference from A, Right, so you have the thought A, you have the inference which takes place grammar internally as it were, and then B is, an external, is externalized. So I don't see any reason to dissociate language from thought here. Um, now Chomsky has a rejoinder here, which is, well, look, that that must mean that externalism, ex sorry, I'll just quote him. That means that externalization must include mental operations like deduction along with phonology and phonetics, and they'd have to be pretty complex. And I wanna thank Noam for that objection because it perfectly sets up Sasha's talk tomorrow in which we talk about our proof theory for natural language. And I would submit right now that, that any such proof theory actually doesn't have to be complex in a certain sense, it's, it's actually kind of bone dumb. There's a fourth argument that's not specifically stated. It is alluded to in this correspondence, which is fascinating, by the way. Um, and I'll call it the generative semantics objection. And the idea is, well, like when you're doing this stuff, trying to say that natural language is the language of thought, aren't you just doing generative semantics. And for those of you who don't know, who don't remember, who haven't read the books about it, in the early 1970s, there was this horrible war inside of linguistic theory between generative semanticists and the Chomsky camp. And the generative semanticists were basically, um, the sort of crude way of putting it is that you had a level of representation D structure or deep structure, and that could be employed as the language of thought. But we're not doing generative semantics here in what I'm proposing, um, because I'm not claiming there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between thoughts and linguistic objects. And I will concede that positive syntactic structures, they will have to dovetail with other elements of the grammar. So I, I, if I found I was positing something in the syntax of natural language, which was alien to the way the rest of the grammar behaved, or it didn't dovetail with the grammar in an interesting way, I would be hesitant about positing this kind of syntactic structure. But I do believe it dovetails. I do believe it dovetails cleanly. And I therefore believe that the syntax, the LF syntax of natural language is fundamentally the vehicle for thought. Now, uh, oh yeah, there's one final objection. If you're doing this, aren't you just a Horfian? Um, and the answer to that is no, I'm not a Horfian uh, because um, I'm not assuming an interesting difference between human languages uh, and uh, what humans are kind of capable of expressing. I think that's an, a, not a good way to put it. Let me, let me put it a, a different way. Um, I'm not assuming an interesting difference between different human languages. That is to say, uh, our, our natural language is part of our 
common uh, uh, genetic endowment, as it were. And when we get to the level of LF, there isn't an interesting difference in the way that humans represent states of affairs in the world. And uh, fundamentally, therefore, their thinking is more or less the same. All right, let's get to part two. How does amelioration and modulation work? And there isn't time to go into a lot of detail here, but I can give you a particular case study. And I'm going to talk about the case Planet, which was in the news lately. And it all started when uh, Jane Liu and David Jewett discovered it's their, the first Kuiper Belt object in 1992. And then they found a whole lot more Kuiper Belt objects or trans-Neptunian objects, if you prefer. This led to a debate at the American Museum of Natural History in 1999. And uh, Janet Liu spoke at that conference and she said the following, we're continuing to try to find more Kuiper Belt objects and the search is going pretty well. What if we find other objects fairly close in size to Pluto, maybe even bigger, or maybe just a bit smaller? Will these objects be called planets or what? And in fact, there are Kuiper Belt, there's at least one Kuiper Belt object that's larger than Pluto, and a number of others that are similar in size. Are we going to call them all planets? Well, this led to Neil deGrasse Tyson, then director of the Hayden Planetarium, Planetarium dem demoting uh, uh, Pluto from the realm of planets, the pantheon of planets, into the realm of Kuiper Belt objects. There was a lot of pushback against this, including from the New York Times, uh, quote, Quietly and apparently uniquely among major scientific institutions, the American Museum of Natural History cast Pluto out of the pantheon of planets when it opened the Rose Center last February. The move is surprising because the museum appears to have unilaterally demoted Pluto, reassigning it as one of more than 300 icy bodies orbiting beyond Neptune in a region called the Kuiper Belt. They are a minority viewpoint. It's absurd. The astronomical community has settled this issue. There is no issue. That's a quote from Alan Stern, who is now at NASA. On the other hand, Phil Plate at Sonoma State weighed in as follows. At the heart of the debate is our very definition of the word planet. Currently, there isn't one. The International Astronomical Union, a worldwide body of astronomers, is the official keeper of names. It has no strict definition of planet but has decreed that there are nine major planets, including Pluto. This, however, is not very satisfying. If the IAD doesn't really know what a planet is, how can it know that there are nine? This leads us to the Planetary Definition Committee of the International Astronomical Union. And I can't, I'm not looking at you, but every time I show this slide in public, everyone laughs. Um, and I understand why. They voted on August 16, 2006, that a planet is an object that one is in orbit around a star, but not another planet. And two is large enough for gravi gravity to form it into a sphere, but not so large as to cause uh, or to trigger nuclear fusion. August 24, 2006, the General Assembly voted and said, no, that's not the satisfactory definition. Uh, we want to add a third clause, which the round object has cleared its orbit. Now, what does all this mean? Michael Ahern, who is in astrophysics at Maryland, said, the reasons we do the classifications is to try to find patterns that will help us to understand how things work or how they came to be. So the way we classify Pluto should be something which helps us to understand how it works or how it came to be. So there's a kind of then mechanics for word meaning modulation. You take certain undisputed cases and then reason analogically for new cases or against familiar cases. So for example, uh, you can reason analogically from the traditional planets to the inclusion of the earth. So, the original pantheon of planets 
had things like J Jupiter, Mercury, Mars, Venus, uh, and the sun and not the earth. But once you understand what's going on, you say, oh, well, actually the earth is like Jupiter, Mercury, Mercury, Venus, Mars. So it should be one of those guys. The sun is not like that. So the sun is out, the earth is in. Why, do you, why did you make that adjustment? Because of the fundamental underlying principles of the things you're talking about. So in reasoning in this way, you see that uh, uh, Pluto is like the undisputed planets and that it's too small for fusion, large enough to be a ball. It orbits the sun, but it's also unlike the undisputed planets and mostly made of ice, not on the same plane, hasn't cleared its orbit, etc. It is more like the Kuiper Belt objects. So you make the adjustment in the range of the lexical item of planet. Um, so there's a kind of way or certain norms for proceeding here, which is that meaning should respect the canonical cases at the fundamental level, but meaning should also track under, under important underlying properties. So uh, I mentioned the case of marriage in the beginning of this talk. Um, the shift that took place in the modulation of the term or lexical item marriage followed similar thinking. That is same-sex marriage is like heterosex marriage in that it involves the same human emotions, commitments, et cetera. Uh, same-sex marriage is unlike it in ways that seem trivial from the viewpoint of human flourishing. In this case, the grounding is in the social realm rather than in the physical realm, right? So the idea is we have this way of modulating meanings of terms. Uh, they're not fixed. We always look for some sort of deeper principle to better anchor the meaning of the term. So these then are my final two kind of points. Uh, first, that changes in lexical meaning front run conceptual changes. So we just went through this whole thing about planet and you might have cast that as uh, the concept of planet, but no one in that discussion was talking about, oh, we must adjust our concept of planet. They were talking about how do we define the terms or what are we gonna call a planet, right? Second, just like you don't add anything meaningful by talking about conceptual structure above and beyond the syntactic lexical structure, you don't add anything by talking about ameliorating concepts instead of modulating word meanings in the lexicon, right? That's all you need to do. You modulate word meanings and your work is done. And thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, if there are questions, please raise your hands. And in the meantime, I would like to ask a very simple question regarding the relationship between modulation and amelioration. I could say that modulation is a more general phenomenon, so that it's very plausible to claim that amelioration is a form of modulation, but perhaps there are forms of modulation that do not count as amelioration. So do you agree with, with that? So which do you think is the more common, amelioration or modulation? Modulation, I would say, is more general. Uh, it's more, well, OK. Um, I have this view, which is somewhat similar to the Davidson passing theory view, which is that when we engage in a conversation, we're modulating word meanings all of the time. And so to use a, an example from Chris Barker, we might, someone might say, well, like John is tall. And what that does is it's modulating the meaning of tall for purposes of the conversation. So it's not like the, we're doing it, but it's not for kind of global uptake. Um, so if you think about the, you're, you're, you're actually modulating, sort of, you're ameliorating the concept tall in this particular instance, but it's, it's not going to last, is what I wanna say. So sometimes we think of concepts as being very permanent, but I'm thinking of concepts as being sometimes, sometimes fleeting, like they're gonna be over with at the end of this conversation. So 
beyond that, I don't see any cases in which modulation is more, more frequent than, than amelioration. Um, you feel free to follow up on that. I, I don't know, it's fine. It's just that you have a broad concept of amelioration. Yeah, that, that, it's, it's fair. Uh, George? Yeah, hi, Peter. Very nice. Um, uh, nice to think about. Um, I guess um, I, I feel you're not doing justice to what I thought was the Chomsky and Petrovsky point, which I would generalize to lots of people going back to you know, Charles Travis and John Searle, and even to Austin and Wittgenstein, um, who point to lots of examples where it seems, you know, our thoughts have a lot more precision than we we're often able to spell out. You know, there's Searle's example of he cut the grass, right? Where, you know, you realize, you know, that, oh, the way we ordinarily understand that involves all sorts of what Searle calls the background. Now, I'm not endorsing, you know, Searle's quite free use of the background uh, and uh, 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 his claims that we can't make it entirely explicit. But I do think one has to acknowledge that it's very difficult, okay? Very difficult to spell out all the background conditions that um, <clears throat> are relevant to understanding the sentence, um, he cut the grass. Okay. Uh, there does, does seem to be a lot we take for granted in conversation uh, that we think, okay, but we don't say. You know, and this gives rise to all the discussions of cognitive and of, of semantic enrichment that one finds in the literature. And, and there are uh, other examples. I mean, there's uh, Austin's very famous, you know, three ways of spilling ink by accident, by mistake, and um, uh, what was the third one? <laughs> um, uh, or he did it, so he, somebody did something freely or voluntarily. In all these cases, you know, philosophers have noticed that the ordinary assertion just has to be spelled out in enormously complex ways. And the question I have for you is, what confidence do you have that we could spell out all out, all, all those conditions out in natural language? I mean, maybe we could, it's just that I need an argument to think you know, for, for the confidence that we could. Well, but uh, all of that back, see, I don't understand what the objection would be to keeping all of that background information represented in the form of syntactic trees, right? So you know, well, if there's some to... if there's some limit to the ability to spell out all of that information, you would have precisely the same problem if you had a Jack and Doff style conceptual structure. Well, you have the same amount of information that you have to represent. So my only and that so this information might be encyclopedic, right? Uh, I didn't say where this information is stored, but the form it's stored in, the data structures that it's stored in, I want to say uh, is in the form of uh, syntactic structures. Yeah, but what's the argument for that? I mean, because it just seems enormously difficult to imagine spelling out all the conditions for somebody doing something freely or by accident or uh, cutting the grass. Uh, I mean, I think Searle is right, and as was Austin and Wittgenstein before them, to call attention to just how enormously complex that background is. And so what I want is a reason to be confident of your claim that I could always find a syntactic structure to express all that relevant information. Well, okay, but let's just let's just take a second part of this first, which is, do you accept that the, the person who's proposing a, a conceptual syntax is going to have precisely the same problem? Um, sure, sure. But okay. I, the, the, uh, All right. So uh, if they have I, the same, so then why, why is this objection? Easy. I simply wanted to challenge your view that, as it were, the difficulty of psychology can be reduced to the difficulty of, 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 uh, of uh, syntax. Seems uh, to be they're both difficult, and I <laughs> well, no, uh, you know, but I'm not proposing. I'm not proposing that I'm solving common sense, the, the psychology of common sense, right? What I'm what I'm saying is, well, what are the data structures in which the representations of common sense psychology would operate, right? Good, good and question. And I have no idea. <laughs> okay, my well, all, right, all right, but okay, so you could propose that it's something else. But and it's not natural language syntax. But once you propose that it's something else, you haven't solved the problem. 
I didn't but say it solved the problem. What I well, want to know is okay, why you're okay, so but confident. Well, you can solve but, why, but then exactly. my point is, why, why, why posit another layer of representation if it's not solving any problem? Oh, because on the face of it, uh, for exactly the reasons that Dickenstein, Austin, Searle, and you know, philosophers in the last 50 years have shown, it's extremely difficult to spell out the truth conditions of natural language sentences. We can think them. We seem to be ha often having determinate thoughts that we simply can't spell out enough of the conditions uh, in natural language. Well, it's just a prima facie difficulty, and you want to know why you're so confident you can solve it. Well, I, here's what I can solve. I mean, I can I can spell out the truth conditions for natural language. I can even give you the proof theory for natural language, right? Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. I can get I can get you I can run the proof theory off of LF representations. Okay. And now if I can do that, then I can reason with those LF representations, right? So those are the vehicles that I'm going to use and, and, and deploy when I do my common sense reasoning. I'm gonna be drawing on my encyclopedic knowledge of like everything from, to cover all those Travis uh, Searle examples. And, like, and then, then, then there's this mystery, which I'm not proposing to solve, which is how does common sense work? I don't know because there are all kinds of heuristics and things going on there that I don't have any access to. All I'm saying is that when you are doing the common sense reasoning, uh, you are manipulating representations that are LF representations. Yeah, and I, I don't see the argument for that. Um, the argument is the Occam's razor argument, which yeah, is that anything yeah, you yeah. propose as an alternative is going to have the same problem. Just and the other the, argument is that I have. From from uh, from uh, uh, London to uh, uh, to uh, New York is to swim in a straight line, right? Or the shortest highway is a straight line between here and uh, California. But simplicity yeah. is it's too early to uh, to to invoke simplicity in such a very very specialized case. No, but the point is, like, uh, it, it's not like I'm invoking wrong. simplicity because I'm I'm taking you away from a better theory. I'm saying you you're proposing a theory which has. Absolutely, all of the problems that the syntax of, of I'm not right. I didn't propose a theory. But I then there is no alternative so theory. Then this is the only theory. Why you were so confident of your rather strong theory? It is strong. that uh, uh, natural language has all the expressive capacities of our concepts. That's a very strong claim. You would it is. Make. That's and what said, makes it interesting. That's what I said. It's an interesting, interesting working yeah. hypothesis. Those are the hypothesis that there's a God who loves us, but I just don't believe it. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I would think that the hypothesis that there's a God that loves us is, is akin to, it's a, it's a brilliant uh, uh, example of, 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 of a posit that is precisely like Jack and Doss conceptual structure, because it's adding nothing. You know, Peter, all I want to hear is an argument, other than Occam's razor. Occam's razor, is it's just- Well, I mean, the, I, but <laughs> the point is that, it, we need some sort of syntactic representational system. We have a syntactic representational system that can do it. Let's deploy it. Let's see if it works. You can call. You, I, I'm not. I'm not telling you that I have a proof that it's true. I'm telling you it's a it's a sound working hypothesis. And you have you gain nothing by taking the more complex working hypothesis that posits an additional level of representation in in a conceptual structure. All right. Well. So we'll have, argue, I'm sure we'll argue many times in the future. Who's next? Who's the moder moderator? <laughs> someone call on someone. I'll call on Nick. OK. Uh, <laughs> I don't so, know how official. Uh, let me give you my list of terms. Um, so Nicholas had a follow up, I think, then John, then David. Is that okay? So, Nicholas. Thank you. Whoever nominated me to go next, thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, George asked the question that I was going to ask. Um, so, but I, I'll, I'll ask the one I thought he was going to ask, which is what about Chomsky's fine thoughts? So, Chomsky says things like, um, uh, you know, people can there are thoughts that people can have, but there's no, there's no sentence which will formulate the thought. So you get these things which are barred by island constraints, like how many mechanics did they wonder if fixed the cars? And in the right context, it seems like you can see what somebody, if somebody actually did produce that, you could, you could see what they would mean. So what, what are you doing in those cases? Because 
um, it seems it seems like it seems like this is a real objection to your view, right? Because not only is it, uh, are those is the no LF which which um, matches that surface string, there couldn't be because it's violating a a, a UG yeah. constraint. And yet yeah. it seems like we know we know what the thought was. How how do we know what, right? What's but the we representation? Have to, yeah, those that's a great uh, example as well. So, but what we have to do is reconstruct them. Right. So philosophers have a way of doing this. So a philosopher will tell you if you take something that violates an island constraint, right? Uh, who, who did you wonder? Uh, uh, I'm 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 blanking on a sort of a of, of an island constraint. I had an island constraint example in my head, and then I lost it. But the, the basic idea is that you say, oh, well, that's ungrammatical, but you know what it would mean, right? So it's like, and the way you do it is you say, well, who is such that blah, blah, blah. And you use this sort of philosopher's trick of using the such that business, which in effect changes the, the, the actual logical form or the syntax of, of the construction. So what you do is you convert it into something that you can process and understand. And, and then that's the one that you end up ultimately tokening when you say you know what it would mean if it was a sentence of English. That's the idea. Okay, thanks. John. We do not hear oh, you. Hi. Yeah, um, I was going to ask the same question as yours, as Nick was going to ask, except I was going to I was going to use the example of vacuous quantification rather than islands. But anyway, um, it, it's in the same ballpark. So I was wondering what the difference is going to be or how much hangs on the difference between the syntax being, in some sense, the structure of thought itself or the mere vehicle for it. Because uh, say if you take the question of kind of indices, for instance, you know, uh, which you mentioned. If, if you're there in syntax, you could be thinking, you know, I have good reason not to like indices, or I'd like to be able to do without indices, right? They look like things that are kind of parachuted into a structure to capture interpretations, and otherwise they don't seem to be required, etc. <clears throat> So suppose you're there in syntax thinking, I don't want indices. Then you come along and say, but look, syntax is matching up with thought, put your indices back in. I mean, I mean, presumably you're, you're not gonna go down that route. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. it's because you've got, as it were, as kind of George was saying, some idea of what the truth conditions are going to be, and then these other, as well, on the face of the autonomous constraints from syntax, which are leading you to think actually there is some kind of mismatch here, and, and, and then you're going to need a bunch of other gizmos to get these two systems kind of working together. Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying this as a kind of refutation of what you were saying, um, or, or even necessarily a challenge, it was just more. I wasn't quite seeing uh, why you wanted to pin so much onto the syntax, given that you're saying, given that you're making a distinction between the vehicle of thought and the structure of thought itself. Anyway, that's so. Yeah, I worry about the index case most of all. Um, I, I would worry about it more. I, I hope this. Si are you hearing the sirens in the background here? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> there's nothing I can do about it. Um, the as long as, as long as it's after you, Peter. <laughs> you never know. Um, the the uh, I would I would worry more about the index case if if they weren't at the very heart of the syntax in the 1980s. Like so, I mean, when Chomsky was proposing indices in the 1980s, basically for for handling these very same constructions, uh, you know, no one was objecting. Uh, you, you're just laying in these, these indices for no apparent reason. Um, now they did integrate and they interacted with the, the, the rest of the GB modules in very interesting ways. Yeah. So, but okay, so then what happens? So now we get into this 
phase of minimalism where ah, maybe we can do without these indices. I mean, that I will say that that, that troubles me a little bit. Um, and I will say that I am a bit suspicious of the elimination of indices. Like I'm not entirely convinced that yet that that can be carried out. Um, I also wonder to what extent um, the industries indices can't be reconstructed. So, you know, there, there always were other options. If you remember Higginbotham, instead of having the indices, he had the little arrows there. And if you can reconstruct the indices based on the history of the merge operations and on the history of movement, then basically you're going to have the information there in any case. So, uh, uh, and if you think about it, the people were just sprinkling the indices on in the end anyway, based on you know, how were those indices put where they were put? It was based on, on various C command relations holding between different kinds of objects and, 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 a, and a handful of axioms about how that should work. So um, if indices are out, then I would, I would probably look for uh, other elements of the syntax in which I would be able to reconstruct this. Mm. So I, 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 yeah, I suppose my worry was more, was more of a kind of methodological one in the sense of which, I mean, you know, who knows what the truth is about indices, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm saying what kind of pressure would you put on, okay, I mean, you know, because the traditional story is, is going to be, look, uh, syntax is kind of autonomous of, yeah. uh, of, of, of semantics, so I can impose constraints upon how I want the syntax to be, uh, independently of something like truth conditions. So, I mean, you, well, I, I mean, suppose, no, well, anyway. there's something a little bit dicey about this, though, which is that, you know, it, there are, it, somehow it has to match up with these inter, interface conditions for the LF interface, mm -hmm. right? Now, if, if you, one of the virtues of the approach that I'm giving here is that it, it makes that an intelligible claim. That is to say, well, we know what the interface conditions are now. We need this kind of level of representation that is interpretable, okay? And if you say, oh, no, but I'm not gonna, I'm gonna add stuff, like if you talk to Petrosky, even things like disjunction get added later. Indices are later, disjunction is later. And so then the question is, well, what constraints are you actually putting on the grammar? And you have to do it because otherwise you're just merging things with no apparent, guide for what what's in and what's out okay so so one uh, one thought is that this is a, a way of putting constraints on what the interface condition has to look like once you abandon this position then it's not clear what the constraints are going to be uh or even if there are any constraints at that point beyond just general intuitions about what you think uh i don't know just suppositions and guesses, I suppose. So now we have a concrete sort of proposal about what the interface has to look like. Sorry, if, if I make just the final point, but, but I take it that what you're saying there would sound like something like <clears throat> the syntax isn't going to contain uh, in some explicit sense the uh, <clears throat> uh, something like the binding relation it's rather that you've got some other system that's going to read for instance a lower copy as a variable or something like that but 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 there's a way of looking at the syntax that itself doesn't contain that kind of information it's just it's got enough structure for this other interpretive system to right i mean quine like quine did this as well he showed yeah. you could you could get rid of the ver get rid of variables under certain circumstances in in certain formal languages so my guess is that if indices are out that the information is going to be recoverable in any case yeah. from okay. structurally recoverable from the syntax okay. good thanks maybe it's all right. Yes, uh, Peter. Thank you for the the talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm wondering now if you've got um, published work arguing that uh, natural language is the language of thought. Because I've read some of your work, as the title of my talk tomorrow probably suggests, and 
it's all very good, but I'm wondering now if I've gotten more from you than I realized, <laughs> because uh, I too want to defend the idea that our natural languages are languages of thought and that uh, logical form and LF correspond, but I, I've been met with the sort of resistance that I think uh, Georges Ray uh, ex excellently uh, exemplified uh, when yeah. I tried to defend this idea back in 2019 yeah, yeah, yeah. when I was reading yeah. my dissertation. I, I find I find it basically all in Davidson. So I guess another question I have is if you also find it in Davidson, this idea. Do I find it in Davidson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just a, a few ideas. Uh, one, uh, that our natural languages are language of thought. Another, that LF or something like LF uh, and logical form correspond. LF being that level of syntactic description relevant to semantic interpretation. Um, uh, I think it's there in Davidson. Yeah. I mean, I asked him about this once and uh, um, but you have to realize his view is a bit more extreme than mine because it's like, he's not gonna allow animals and babies and things to be having thoughts because you have to, it has to be natural language. Yeah, well, so I was always just thinking that by thought he meant propositionally articulated thought of the sort that's distinctively human so that the claim is kind of just a verbal point. I mean, that's the way I would always read it. Uh, that's a charitable reading, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, could, I could get behind that. About stuff that I've written on this, if you go back to my book on semantics, tense, and time, there's some mm -hmm. stuff in the appendix about it. Okay. Um, and then the book that Sasha and I wrote that just came out last February, um, um, the title of which is a oh, Language, Form, and Logic, uh, where we go talk about the proof theory business. Um, to some extent, Sasha's talk tomorrow is going to be related to this. I, I'm not saying he buys this about concepts but he, he's going to advocate what we call the zero interface, which is that we don't want to posit an additional representational layer uh, after LF. When you finish the LF, you're done. But it's sort of, um, um, at this point, it's a working hypothesis more than anything. And so, I'm, and so this talk is sort of just me returning to that topic and starting to work on it. Do you, uh, I mean, the way you work this out and the way, say, Petrovsky uh, might work things out could differ. I mean, maybe you come up with different forms, but, but couldn't you see part of what Petrovsky is doing is just saying, hey, there's a thing that I think uh, we can call semantics and we've got the tools to do it. Um, it's gonna be syntax in the broad sense, as Chomsky says, yes. and we'll leave the rest of the work to some later date. We'll probably ne never get around to it though, because it's too complicated, it's not tractable. <laughs> so we'll just work on this small little project. But he doesn't deny, of course, that we can have true thoughts. I mean, I, I take it he thinks that he's got mostly true thoughts to express on this topic. Um, so, I mean, there's a sense in which we're all in agreement. It's just a question of where we draw the- It's, it's a kind of a bookkeeping thing. So, yeah. and I've, I've like argued with Paul about this a lot too. So. So uh, on his view, then there's the kind of LF syntax, and then there's lots, lots of other stuff that you have to call and access. A lot of other stuff, because remember, Paul's theory is just you're just you're just merging things, and you're you're just concatenating things, as it were, or conjoining things. Okay, so you're just conjoining things. Well, then you want to say, well, how does how does universal quantification work, and how do how do disjunctions work? Because none of that works just from conjunction, and then he says, "Well, but then you will you're going to call this concept of disjunction or something." So even something as basic as disjunction comes later in this sort of in this uh, conceptual level syntax. Okay, again, it's syntax broadly understood. Mm -hmm. So so we're all in the same basic philosophical project, right? We're on the same team. Uh, but the the idea is well okay where does the LF syntax end and where does the the rest of the broader syntax that gets you to thought begin and then my answer is well <laughs> LF syntax is the end and that's where the, the thinking takes place and I'm I'm 
I, I'm troubled by the route that that Paul and Chomsky are going down here because it it you know once you start saying things like ah oh, well disjunction is just this concept that you're going to pull out of you know pull out of out of the air pull out of conceptual space or something like that I mean that's troubling to me and then when you're going that route then I wonder well then what what could the what could the interface constraints on LF possibly be at that point. I mean, so uh, we have, uh, Sasha and I have lots of ideas about how this works. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you thought it was too complicated to carry out. I, I don't agree with that. I think that's an excessively uh, pessimistic view of the matter. I think that- Well, that, that was more speaking as Petrosky, but yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, good. I'm sorry I attributed that to you. Yeah. So no, I'm very optimistic that, that this can be executed in LF syntax. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. But George. <laughs> I but just want George, to think yeah. what I thought uh, John and Nick did a better job of expressing when they tried to express what I was saying. Okay. I, I think it could be put succinctly this way. Uh, look, Chomsky, I think brilliantly, you know, hypothesized a specific system that allows us to understand natural language, acquire and understand natural language. It's a remarkable hypothesis that he supported over the last 60 years, uh, you know, involving a lot of very specific and, and as Nick you know, emphasized, idiosyncratic facts about the system. Okay. Um, why well, think our conceptual scheme is, is uh, you know, our conceptual system is constrained in nearly the same way? It would be like, imagine somebody who said, oh, you know, um, uh, 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 syntax is enough for vision or vision, you know, vision is enough for thought. Take somebody who thought that you know the visual system was enough to express all thought, some crazy imagistic you know uh, th theorist, and you'd say, well, gee, the constraints on vision are very very specific. Okay, why well, think those specific constraints on vision would generalize to uh, cognition in general? Similarly for the gr grammatical system. Yeah, um, I mean that's a good question too. But the, you know, the if you'll think about some of the arguments we have against sort of visual thinking. So there's the Descartes business about, you know, the Chiliagon versus the 1001 sided figure. And so you can't distinguish an image between a thousand sided figure and a 1001 sided figure, but you can distinguish them linguistically as it were. And all of the cases where, you know, you come up with the limitations of, of imagistic thinking, all, you know, Fodor and all these people have all these arguments uh, that you're always expressing the content that is missing in linguistic terms. Yeah, so but that's because of the point of the cases of, of uh, uh, cutting the grass, or he did something voluntarily or freely, is that they all <laughs> seem to be, uh, the thought seems to be so much richer than the syntactic uh, object uh, is able to express. Well, but, but we, I mean, you're asking me to, to exhaust the thought with one syntactic object, when of course, you know, that's not what's going on, right? No, so you can try 12 if you like. Right. So, so then, then my, the response is going to be, well, what is it that you think, <laughs> what is it that you think that cannot be uh, linguistically expressed that's Look missing? Look at the history of philosophy for the last several hundred years, where philosophers have tried to make explicit what the thought is that when, uh, about freedom or about uh, volition or about intention, or even about cutting the grass. It just turns out to yeah. be tremendously, tremendously difficult. And I'm not well, saying Cyril is right in, in saying it's impossible. I just want to see an argument to, to say that it, it would be possible to, to, uh, uh, to exhaust the, the cognitive uh, content with this, the outputs of this very specific organ we have of grammar. Well, I mean, first of all, there's, there's nothing in the story that's going to give you precision. So, so it's not going to solve issues like like vagueness, for example, or anything like that. So I'm assuming that the semantics that we're running is going to be open, open textured, as Frederick Weissman used to say. Um, so nothing in this story says that the meanings, et cetera, can't be open textured. And uh, there's nothing in this approach which sort of makes in, uh, uh, open textured meanings incoherent. So then that just leaves you with the kind of background information or background knowledge that is necessary to understand fully what's being said or what's being communicated. And the basic view is I, I don't see any, I don't see any argument that that cannot or is not represented 
in a standard syntactic structure, even though it's sort of stored as encyclopedic information or, or some such thing. Um, as far as the argument is concerned, I know you don't like the, I know, I, I know you don't like the Occam's razor argument, but my point here is, is not necessarily that you should believe that this is the, this is the God's honest truth so much as believe me when I say that you're not helping your cause by adding an extra layer of syntactic structure that you call conceptual structure. I mean, that's the big point. You still have a, someone still has a hand up, but Nick, is it? Nick, why don't you Nick? go on? Uh, well, I was waiting for the chair to. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Like, uh, I, I just want. Much time. Uh, Sorry. If you come be quick, then um, go ahead. But be quick, please. Okay, thank you very much. So um, it's just really by way of taking another swing at this same thing. So um, it seemed like, um, I mean, a, a, an attempt to do a little bit of burden shifting here. I mean, I, I guess I'm, so I, I'm also very tempted by the thought that uh, natural language is the language of thought, but I worry probably more than you seem to about the explicitness problem, which I guess is what the, the problem that George has been raising. Um, and I, I also, so um, a lot of the, your, the jacket off and pink objections you were reacting to um, are about there being two sentences which correspond to one thought. And you correctly point out that's no objection. I agree with that fully. It seems to me that the kind of argument that, that people like um, George are worried about is that there's one sentence for many thoughts. And to do a little bit of burden shifting here, I mean, those of us who work in pragmatics um, over the last 20, 30 years have, have taken it to be the case that there are many, many examples which show that somehow your sentence is a clue to your thought, that you're, there's just not enough there in the sentence to fully represent and spell out your thought. And that's, that's the issue that, you know, that's what worries me. And I think that's, that's the issue that, that's animating Georges' complaint. And I, I don't know, do you think, do you, are you not moved by the burden shifting here? No, I understand completely well what you're saying, but my picture is something like this. There's some thought that you have that you are representing. Let me put it in Gracian terms. There, there's some thought that you have that gives rise to your utterance, right? Then there's the thought that you express. And then there's the thought that you intend me to come to have, all right? Now, uh, those might be um, uh, so what, what we're talking about here is the is the structure of the thought that's expressed. You may take me to take this thought, right? And to add it to my encyclopedic information and to do some enrichment is fine here, right? I have no problem with enrichment in, 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 in the relevance theory sense or any other sense. So that you know you're gonna take this sentence since I'm gonna to go to work on it and infer something else. And there's gonna be something that you want me to infer. But at every step of the way, the theory is that these are syntactic representations, both in the thought that you have that gives rise to your utterance, the utterance that you express, and the utter and the content that you expect me to come to have. Thanks. That that's actually really helpful in understanding. Okay. Your view. I mean, like your view of of, of how sentences and communication relate to sentences and thought. Thank you. Peter, thank you once again for your time. Thanks, guys. Great questions. Great, <laughs> great exchange. Thanks a lot. Today's session was very rich in both linguistic and philosophical content. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and see you tomorrow. Bye.